Hello, you silly radio. This is Dr. No, and this is my interview with Nina Tavaluri. All right, well, first off, I'd like to begin with how you first got involved in beauty pageants because Miss America was hardly the first one you took part in. Could you tell our listeners <laughs> about could you tell our listeners about this circumstances in which you first started participating in them? Congratulations, and what's it called? I mean, you're lucky. You're luckier than a lot of most students because what's it called? A lot of us are swamped with the debt. I might have to go. Right. I might have to go into pageants myself then, knowing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so um, uh, one of the factors in your decision to compete for Miss America was a desire to challenge the stereotype of its participants as predominantly blonde-haired, blue-eyed, or as you put it in an interview with um Vogue, the girl next door. Would you say this was true for you during those earlier pageants, or did this desire not take form until later? You know, I can honestly say that when I was a teen, I certainly didn't have this perspective. Um, I always knew that I was different as a contestant. Um, even when I was a teenager, I you know, competed with a Bollywood dance, um, and that was just something that I never even second-guessed because it was a huge part of who I was. I grew up classically trained in Indian form of Bharatanatyam, um, so this was a huge part of my identity. And I think when I took about, you know, some time off with my platform also and coming back as a Miss Contestant for Miss New York and everything, um, it was a very different perspective that I had, especially when you have more life experiences going to college. Um, I grew up with so many stereotypes and misconceptions about my culture. Um, and so even my platform, which I championed this entire year, celebrating diversity through cultural competency, um, essentially I've been promoting it for my entire life, but officially for four years now. So that's not something I just decided to wake up as Miss America and promote. Um, it's something that I've been working very closely with for a very long time. And so going into the organization, um, yes, I, I went in with a vision of wanting to change who Miss America was. Um, because I grew up watching Miss America feeling like I could never be in this role because I didn't look a certain way. I wasn't your stereotypical blonde hair, blue light girl. Um, I certainly didn't have a normal talent or what would people consider to be a normal talent. Um, and so I knew that should I win, it would be historic and monumental for the organization. But I also think it was so timely for this organization to finally reach out to a new demographic of young women that's representative of what America is today. And ultimately, while it was great that I was able to achieve this dream of mine, it wasn't about me. It was about reaching out to that young girl who I knew was watching Miss America the night I won, and for her to finally be able to say, wow, this year Miss America looks like me, um, and I don't have to have, you know, what to look a certain way or have a stereo, you know, a normal talent to be in this role or have this job, and that's essentially the beauty of the American dream. Yeah, it, it, I would say that very much is the American dream. And not only did you, Emma, challenge the stereotype that um, non, that non-white woman can't be Miss America, but as the Vogue article pointed out, you also challenged another stereotype that a woman can't be both beautiful and intellectually apt. <laughs> did this? Thank you. Oh, oh you're welcome. That is, uh, I mean, and that's something that I've been also, you know, really trying to 
trying to educate this entire year is um, really, first and foremost, present myself from a scholastic point. Um, I'm very proud of my degree from University of Michigan. Um, I'm currently in the process, like I mentioned, of applying to MBA program. So my education is, is very important to me. I grew up in a household where education wasn't an option. It was, you know, something that we were very, um, it just surrounded my childhood so much um, and translates you know, to even the person I am today. And while Miss America was great and it's been a wonderful avenue, um, a degree lasts much longer than, you know, I suppose um, something like Miss America. Yeah, well, yeah, well, it was, um, it, what's it called, like I said, what's it called, it was a very, what's it called, it is very important in, in going towards um, smashing stereotypes and like about, and to, well, about intellectual, intellectuality and stuff, so. Yeah. So it is. Yeah. yeah. You're welcome. Thank and what's it called? Thank you for um. Uh, well, thank you for um uh, starting this conversation. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. And you have also said that when you first started first started participating in pageants, you were actually quite shy. With this in mind, would you say you were apprehensive about them? Um, I was. I had always been a very quiet person growing up. I was very shy, um, and I just really didn't talk very much and I think it's because I also have an older sister and we're 18 months apart she's my best friend so she kind of did all the talking so I didn't have to um I guess but obviously you know being able to communicate is such an important aspect of being a you know of being a real person I suppose of, of being able to uh, present yourself in a certain way and so communication was something that that did come very natural to me even though in I suppose real life I'm a little quieter but I was able to, I was fortunate enough to, my family really um, also pushed being able to communicate effectively with people from a young age. And so that was something interviewing that came natural to me. And um, it's, it's, you know, I will always say that Miss America really is one in the interview room because we have a 10 minute private interview with a panel of seven judges. Um, and they can ask you any question It's our game from current events to your platform to personal um, questions. Um, because your job at this America, or my job, I should say, is to first and foremost be an advocate and a speaker for not only myself and my platform, um, but also the organization as a whole. And I'm out there oftentimes, um, you know, I'm the only person where people representing the organization that people will meet. And so she is first and foremost a businesswoman and um, a speaker and advocate. So that's really where Miss America is won in that interview room because these are the skills that will translate um, for lifelong uh both as well. Mm, I see, I see. And, well, another another personal obstacle that you have opened up about and spoken about was an eating disorder, which you which you actually overcame two years prior to becoming Miss America. And was the, pro- right. was the prospect of opening up about that hard for you, or did you have little, end up having a little trouble doing so? No, it was, it was actually very hard. Um, and... I talked about it more from a cultural standpoint. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I struggled with an eating disorder when I was in college, um, and it was very difficult for my parents to understand what I was going through. Um, and that's not to say, and I think it was very cultural too, and that's not to say that eating disorders don't exist in India because they absolutely do. I think mental health has a stigma surrounding it globally that I certainly hope by more people talking about it, it will dissipate. And so for me, even to this day, my mom has asked me why I've chosen to talk about it um, or why I, I suppose, air the dirty laundry, <laughs> um, especially coming from a South Asian family. And if I'm able to help one person along the way or speak to one girl for her to be able to ask for help, I know that that's made a difference. And so that's why I've, I've really chosen to speak about it from this cultural standpoint. And if I didn't have my sister or someone safe that I felt comfortable to talk to, um, it would have been very hard for me to, to overcome it. And so since then, I think even competing, you know, I um, had, you know, had counseling and treatment for this. Even competing, it was still, um, it's still something that you always want to tread lightly over um, because it is, a, it is a very difficult, uh, I suppose, obstacle and it's a never-ending battle. I see, I see. Well, it's, it's, what's it called? I'm a, it's very, it's, um, what's it called? We're very, I think we're all very pleased that you were able to overcome this, what's it called? This, this serious illness, you know? And you mentioned that, what's it called? Mental illness has like a, there's a stigma around it just around the world. And I, I, I've been wondering, I was like, 
Uh, well, why, why, why do you think that is? I'm, I'm just really because I mean I think about it, but I can't really, I, I myself can't pinpoint a reason for why it, there would be such an, it, it, like a stigma around it. Right, and I agree. Um, I think, I think now it, there, it certainly is. Um, it is dissipating as more people talk about it, more people are aware about mm-hmm. it. Um, but you know, for me, all I can say is that it was just very cultural, and so I feel like in, in many cultures it's viewed that way. But um, I can't you know, pinpoint a single reason, like you said as well. I see, I see. Because, like, I mean, I'm not, like, obviously as schooled in the subject, but, like, I kind of remember, like, um, well, like, back in, like, earlier centuries or whatever, like, in Western society, there would always be, like, you know, like, the quote-unquote village idiot, you know, or, like, uh, there would be, like, so the mentally ill would be kind of just be, like, oh, everybody, they're kind of, like, everybody's business. Nobody's quite responsible for them, but, like, everybody's kind of... But, and now it seems like, kind of like the opposite, like you said, it's like, it's a stigma around it. It's kind of like, if people are mentally ill people, like, we don't see them, you know? So, mm-hmm. yeah, it's just, it's interesting to think about. All right. All right, and your crowning as Miss America was notoriously greeted in some internet circles with xenophobic and bigoted comments, misidentifications of you as, as a Muslim or Arab, and even linking you to Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups. Many people have explained why such comments are wrong and offensive, but I thought the comments of the second variety were especially funny given the history between India and much of the Muslim world, which has been, to say the least, far from amicable. I mean, what's, what's really interesting, I suppose, is that I received very similar remarks when I won the title of Miss New York. Um, I was flat out called a terrorist. Um, I think, you know, other terms to that degree as well, uh, like you mentioned. And so when that happened when I was Miss New York, I have to say I was taken aback. And I remember sitting down with my mom and sister and just saying, you know, gosh, why is this happening? I've always viewed myself as first and foremost American. Um, I was born in Syracuse. My platform is diversity. Um, and so these were educated people making these comments. And to me, it was absolutely intolerable. And I think hindsight really is twenty twenty because if that hadn't happened when I won the title of Miss New York, I don't think I would have been able to handle it in the way that I did when I won the title of Miss America. And going in, I remember even saying this in my interview um, with our with our judges, and I said that these remarks have happened, and should I win Miss America, they'll probably happen again on a much larger scale. And now I know how to handle it and address that issue. And I was able to address this, you know, my platform essentially on national news networks spark not only um, a national conversation, but I think really a global international conversation um, about race and ethnicity and diversity. And being able to spin this in a positive way is, is what I'm most proud of. And not only that, I think for every one negative comment, tweet, or post, I received hundreds, if not thousands, of words of positive encouragement and support from people all across the world. Um, and to continue that momentum throughout my entire year and beyond is, is, is what I'm just so very grateful for. And I'm really happy to continue to champion this alongside many others who believe in it as well. Yeah, well, I got to say, you handle yourself very well in the, in the face of what's called those hateful comments and, and other what's called posts, you know. And... Yeah, and thank you. You're welcome. And interestingly, a similar but very distinct discussion arose in Indian social media after your victory, which, with some commenters claiming, and this might come as a, come as a surprise to many Americans, that you would not win a similar contest held in India because, well, complexion-based discrimination is still very prevalent in that country. Apparently, were you aware of this discussion? Yeah, uh, and you were aware of this discussion yeah. then. I was. um, Well, I was aware that these comments were being made, and um, what I have loved about it is that it's something that I can absolutely resonate with, because now I'm reaching out to a a demographic of young young Indian girls who are living in India, and feeling that they're not beautiful because they don't have fair skin, or they don't look a certain way, and that's exactly the image of beauty, or that signal beauty that I wanted to overcome being in this role as Miss America. Um, for people to not, you know, to, to embrace their identity and their culture and heritage. And so what was really interesting from my aspect of it is that I grew up, you know, in an Indian family. And, of course, you know, my family would always say, my mom and my aunt would say, oh, don't go out in the sun, you're going to get too dark. But then I would be in school and my peers and classmates and teachers would say, oh, my goodness, you have such a beautiful skin tone. And it's 
that beauty standard of wanting what we can't or what we don't have. And um, I think even, I think talking about it and breaking these beauty standards and, and really, like I said, promoting myself from an educational scholastic standpoint um, is what I'm most proud of and being that speaker and advocate um, and for encouraging all young women to embrace who they are and love who they are and stand up for who they are is the message I really tried to send. Mm, so the so the um, a message you sent to um, a Indian to um, a Indian woman like actually live in India is um, a, it, it's very similar to what you're sending to women in Indian uh, Indian Americans. So, what would you say so then? Yeah, I would. I mean, and like I said, I think the beauty of of being an, of being American is that regardless of your race, your gender, your socioeconomic status, your ethnicity, is that you can be anything that you want to be, so long as that you work hard for it. Um, and I think also just breaking down those stigmas and those beauty standards and starting this conversation is the first step for people to um, really embrace who they are and also self-esteem. And I think that's what many young girls, not only here, not only in America or India, but across the world always struggle with is kind of these unattainable beauty standards that are across the world, across many cultures. Yeah, yeah. So I guess I guess I have to agree about I have to agree about that. I mean, like I said, I'm not, and like I said earlier, I'm not obviously schooled, but I do. I see that. I see that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and well, Emma, you you we've we've been we've been talking about it, and but and so your platform was celebrating diversity through cultural competency. Would you care to expound upon it for our listeners? Yeah, absolutely. So. One of the things that I started, like I said, even before I won, was my own organization. And I partnered with the YMCA and YWCA um, because I grew up with a lot of stereotypes and misconceptions about my culture. Um, I was the only Indian girl in many of my classes for many, many years. So I was often mistaken for Native American when I lived in Oklahoma. My family lived there for about seven years. Um, people would always ask me if I was going to have an arranged marriage or what the red thought meant or if I worship cows and the list goes on. And many of these remarks weren't necessarily meant to be malicious, but really simply due to the fact of ignorance. And um, so one of the things that I really promote about cultural competency is that it's not about opening a discussion about race because that hasn't necessarily proven to be effective. I think what's more effective is that when we engage children with hands-on activities, and unfortunately, there aren't a lot of programs in schools that really promote this idea or aspect. You might have, sure, they certainly might have a, you know, a program maybe one day out of the, the, the school year to promote cultural awareness, um, but there's no consistent program. So I reached out to, like I said, the YMCA and YWCA because they have after-school programs. And so we started this monthly program where children would come in and learn about a different country. And it's not just learning, you know, looking at it on a map and studying it. It was really about either teaching them a different instrument from that country, um, learning a different language, or even something as simple as trying a different, you know, food or cuisine from that country. And this is something that will engage children so they can touch things, feel things, taste things, um, and really get hands-on activities opposed to just sitting in a lecture and learning about it. And I think if they're exposed to these um, different sort of activities from a young age, that's what will really help break those stereotypes, get them curious about learning about the world, traveling the world, um, and asking questions about different cultures. Oh, I see, I see. And it's very it's very timely that this should be your platform because the word diversity has become it's become very prominent in the last few years, particularly on college campuses. And how so the cynical might even are they might even argue that the word is oversaturated or a euphemism <laughs> yeah, or a euphemism for a white person, a black person and a brown person who all say the same thing. How can we ensure that diversity, whether it be in universities or elsewhere, is genuine and keep it from becoming just a buzzword? Well, I do think it's a buzzword. Uh, you know, I, I do somewhat agree with that statement because we hear about it everywhere and it's and it's always talked about, but it's never really, the, the core of it isn't really being addressed. Mm-hmm. And that's why I like the idea and aspect of cultural competency, because it's about finding an understanding between people of all different cultures and all backgrounds, not necessarily agreeing with them, because that's not realistic nor ideal, mm-hmm. but finding a way to communicate with one another in an open and respectful manner. And I think that's important from an educational standpoint, translating to professional business world, um, especially now that all of our, you know, our, the world is becoming more global and our economies are more connected. It's really important to understand that aspect to be able to work with one another. 
Yeah. All right. Well, what's it called? Th- thank you. That's what. That's what I. That's what I thought the. I. I. I that's what I suspected the through cultural competency part of your platform meant. But I, and I wanted to see if that's if I was correct, kind of. So. Yeah. yeah well, th- thank you very much. It's what's it's called. It's a much more. I would say it's a much more thought out and like and nuanced um, um, definition of diversity than what's it called. I hear a lot, so what's it called? Right. I'm very, yeah, so it's called, I'm Thank very, you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for putting so much thought into it. <laughs> In addition to diversity, you spent your year as Miss America promoting STEM, or science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Having a background in science yourself, what would you say is the, is the biggest challenge for facing advocates of those fields of study today? need to start introducing STEM at, um, at the elementary school level. Right now it's really being pushed in the middle school level, but we're already losing young women, especially um, even when they get to middle school. Um, so I think if they have more activities um, from the elementary school level where they're doing experiments, where they're doing science experiments and hands-on activities, again, um, is, is really valuable to the learning process. I think also the other thing is really um, having more resources available for students, for students, teachers, um, and college and universities also to uh, think outside the box of what STEM is. There are so many fields um, that encompass STEM that people not, might not necessarily think of. Um, I think we're often so confined to thinking doctor, engineer, computer programmer, um, et cetera. And while those are great fields, um, one of the things that I like to talk about with young girls especially is that as Miss America, I was able to um, create my own lip gloss with a cosmetic sponsor. Um, I'm in a lab, you know, have my lab coat and glasses on, also in chemistry class, um, which was one of my favorite subjects. And being able to learn how to make something, um, you have the option to either make your own lip gloss or buy your own lip gloss. Um, and so to encourage them to be innovators and thinkers um, in terms of these stem-related fields that they might not typically associate with. Mm, I see. I see. So you would say that it's some um, uh, getting people to understand that there are white there are, there are what's wider applications of the STEM fields than just the little narrow ones that we t- tend to think of them as. Then, right? Absolutely. Mm, yep. You see. Well, in the spirit of promoting STEM, what science books, if any, would you recommend to our listeners, and why these particular ones? What science books? Um, unfortunately, I don't think I'm allowed to answer that question. Oh. <laughs> oh, um, sorry for being on the Well, well, let's, um, uh, well, I, I, I assumed you would because you, you, you have a background, you have a background in science. You're a bachelor, you got a bachelor of science degree in brain behavior and cognitive science from the mm-hmm. University of Michigan. So let's call it, I mean, that's pretty impressive. I mean, I. I, I can barely can barely pass a chemistry course, but and originally you planned to go to medical school to become a doctor, but you have since changed plans. Are there any circumstances in which you see? Oh wait, you. I'm sorry. This was a pre-written question, and you answered you answered this earlier in the interview. I'm sorry about that. That was a, that was a brain fart okay. on my part. No worries. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, um, uh, well, uh, as we wind, well, um, what's it called? I think we're coming to the close of the interview, so as we wind down, I'd like to talk about something with a, a little less weighty, and you, you, what's it called? you referred to yourself as a nerd on several occasions, so would you like to talk about that? <laughs> yeah, I'm so proud to be to call myself a nerd, um, and, and I've touched on this so many times, especially for young girls when I go into high schools or middle schools um, or conferences, and I see young women there, it's, it's very... Um, it's not typical for them to associate Miss America with a STEM degree. Um, associate, you know, this idea of beauty pageant, which I certainly hope that term is being used less and less because there's so much more um, that encompasses the organization than just beauty. Um, and, I, and I think it's sad because, like I said, everyone sees that one night on television when Miss America is crowned, but they don't see what she does the other 364 days a year. And um, it's just, it's, it really is a job that is, you have to be intelligent to be able to do this job. You're in a room with, you know, I've lobbied um, on the Hill with congressmen and senators. I've been fortunate enough to meet with the president and first lady. And so you have to be intelligent um, and well-spoken to be able to be in this role. And um, so to see someone like Miss America um, promoting STEM and as a role model for young women is um is definitely one of the most important aspects that I've really tried to promote this year, and um, so it's been it's been really nice to kind of say that yes, I do 
I do love math. I do love science. Um, and there, there are fields that I was good at and was really proud to be good at them. Um, but also be that well-rounded person. Um, and as much as I love Star Trek and Lord of the Rings and all that sci-fi stuff, um, and Star Wars as well, of course, um, but there's, I think it's, it's okay to, to find that balance and with the stigma of the term nerd because being smart is, is, is cool. Yeah, it's starting to... It's- it, yeah, things have really turned around for nerds within the past 10 years or so, because I remember when I was young, what's called the nerds, nerds were still dweebs, you know, everybody liked to pick on them, and they were mostly, they were mostly men, and now what's called 10 years later, what's called Miss America 2014 was, is, was nerd, you know, so, what can you talk about, you should go Star Wars, Star Trek, and Lord of the Rings, yeah, you know? I'm proud of it. Yeah, what's it called, so, that's three stereotypes you broke right there. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. You mentioned Star Trek, and what's called? I'm a bit of a, I'm a bit of a Trekkie myself, and what's called? I, I, what's called? I, would, I'm, I don't want to put you on the spot for this one, but have you ever seen um, uh, the the third series, Star Trek: Deep Space Nine? No, I haven't. I, I, but one of the one of the favorite people I've met this year, I was able to meet George Takai, mm-hmm. um, one of the first um, Star Trek interviews I did was with him and we had such an amazing discussion um, actually surrounding diversity and cultural competency and race and so that was definitely one of uh, a pretty cool highlight that I got to do that with him. Yeah, well, that's 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 really awesome because it's called, I've been hoping to interview him at some point too. I actually emailed his website, but I never heard back. So I'm hoping I'm hoping to get him on. Yeah, yeah. But what's it called? But but I mean, you're really but awesome for you. I mean, that, that's awesome. <laughs> I would love to meet the guy. And also, but I would really recommend Star Trek: Deep Space Nine because it's just it's what's it called considered by many to be the most um uh, intellectual of the okay. series and addresses serious social issues so check it out if you have ever had the chance it's really good it's really I good will. I'll add it to the list. <laughs> yeah all right and so i'm um, uh, do you have any i um, mean you have them um, up uh, you you've spoken about your circles of diversity project and would you like to talk about that or any other upcoming projects you would like to tell our listeners about right um so my ongoing social media campaign is called circles of unity and I actually started that at the local level where um, I had third graders paint unity tiles, and we placed the tiles across um, areas in the community, so restaurants, Starbucks, libraries, um, and whoever saw the tile in the community, we asked people to take a picture of it and kind of tweet what they thought or how it represented diversity, and um, then hashtag circles of unity. So that's how the campaign started about four years ago, and um, as Miss America now it's uh, we've tweaked it a little because, unfortunately, I can't go around painting tiles everywhere. Um, but it's now more of a social media campaign where I've asked people to tweet me their thoughts um, of what they think it means to be culturally aware. Um, so tweet me your thoughts, your pictures, uh, videos about what that means to you, and hashtag circles of unity. And so I always retweet. I always respond. Um, that's something I really like to, to keep going. It's a really nice message. Um, and to to create that positive discussion via social media. So you can do that at Nina Davalori is my handle. I'm also on Instagram at Real Nina D. And you can follow me and keep up with my travels there. All right. Well, th- thanks for the thanks for the heads up about those. And so on a final parting question, um, what advice would you would you like to give to college students who might be anyone who might be listening? Right. Definitely to follow your passion. I mean, I think college is, is an important time of finding yourself and um, and what you want to do. But I promise you, if you first find your passion and follow it, you will be successful because your heart's going to be into it. Um, and that's something that I discovered a little later, I suppose, in college. Um, but but when you follow what you're really passionate about, then um, you, you're, you're bound to be successful because of that. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, to thank you again for for coming on the show, Miss Davaluri, and unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. And let's go. I don't want to keep. I don't want to keep you for too long. <laughs> so yeah, but again, thank you so much for being on the program. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you very much, Miss Davaluri, and you have a. All right. Oh, let me plug you in first. All right. Before we go. All right. So this okay. is once again. This is Nina Davaluri. She was Miss America 2014, and she is now. She. She is now um a, um sorry um well how how would you put you're a public speaker now? Yeah, speaker and advocate um for for diversity and cultural competency. Okay, and she is a speaker for diversity and competency for for diversity and competency and cultural competency. And cultural competency. Yeah, yeah. yeah so thank you again, Mrs. Davalori, and have a fantastic day. All right.
Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yep, bye.